Hi, everyone in the room. Hi, everybody online. If you cannot uh, hear us uh, online, let us know and we'll figure out something. So thanks for coming. Um, today will be Elise Barron's presentation. I met Elise in 2015 when she was looking for rice husks in uh, used as temper in pottery shirts. And uh, she was very successful doing that. That led her to a uh, paper published in scientific reports and then to undertake a PhD to explore how a micro CT could be used to address uh, archaeological and archaeobotanical questions. And Ali's presentation today will be uh, about the, uh, the journey that you went through the last uh, three or four years. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Elise's uh, final presentation for the PhD. So, Let's get uh, going and uh, I'll leave you the room. I'll just uh, make sure that everything's okay. Let you go. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Let us know if there are any issues on Zoom. Um, all right. So. My PhD is in two things, basically. The use of uh, micro CT as an imaging technique and then applying that to archaeobotanical materials. Um, and as Nashi said, uh, it started, sort of started in my master's. So my master's sort of bled into the PhD. So um, I'll just, I'll talk you through how that happened. Um, all right. So I am planning to submit my thesis by publication. Um, and so straight up, this is how me and my supervisor Tim Denham had visualized my thesis. Um, it's easier to see it this way because it sort of turned into a series of case studies as opposed to just one long thesis. Um, so for us, it sort of makes more sense to do a series of case studies because it turned into more of a methodological study rather than like a look at one key site or region. Um, so overall, there'll be seven publications, um, but five main like data-centric papers, which shows them in the middle. Um, and they're split into two sections. So looking at two major um, uh, groups of uh, food crops, we've got those plants that are sexually propagated, so the common cereal crops, um, and then we have asexually propagated crop crops, so like roots and tubers. Um, so with applying the method of micro CT to both major groups of crop, um, and so the thing that links it together is that technique. Um, and then just the discussion paper to be published last. Um, all right, this is just an introduction to our current map of um, domestication of plant species in the past. Um, so our, the archaeobotanical view of domestication has changed significantly in the last few decades in that we no longer adhere to that model of, you know, agriculture just like sprung up in the, in the Near East and the Fertile Crescent. Um, we now have a whole series of regions uh, where different sorts of plants have been domesticated in different ways, different plant management practices, not always um, what we traditionally know as agriculture. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a number of the species today that are um, under understudied uh, significantly when compared to the, the major cereal crops like wheat and barley. Um, there are so many others that we know next to nothing about. Um, so we've got oh, we've got rice in China. Quite a lot of work has been done there, um, and then we've got obviously the cereals in the Near East. Um, today I'm going to be talking about rice a little bit, but in Southeast Asia. Um, and then these other vegetatively propagated crops. Um, so that is sugarcane, bananas, yams, um, and tar. Um, two cereal crops uh, that definitely needs a lot more work is sorghum and pearl millet. So we're talking about them today. Um, and then a little bit of sweet potato, which came into Southeast Asia from uh, the Americas. Um, so this is from a paper uh, led by my supervisor that I was on last year, um, just outlining what the major cereal, well, the major uh, food crops are, um, but just how little we know about 
these crops that are like major staples of our food economy. Um, so again, I'll be talking about some of these lesser known ones, so sweet potato, yam, children, and pellets. <laughs> All right, so just a quick intro to MicroCT. Um, so I, even though I'm in the School of Archaeology and Anthropology, um, I work a lot over in the National Laboratory for X-ray Microcomputer Tomography. It's a bit of a mouthful, Lever. Uh, CT lab. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so uh, MicroCT is basically 3D X-rays. So got the, um, the CT machine here, just looks like a big lead box. Um, and then always a basic setup of you have your X-ray source and then your camera that collects the X-rays and then you place your sample in between. Um, the x-rays um, pass through the sample. Some get attenuated at different rates uh, based on the density of your material. Just like if you get a, an x-ray for broken arm, um, if there's bone, not as many x-rays pass through um, and that is recorded um, by the screen here. Um, and this just shows with the, the x-rays are obviously off and so I can film it. Um, but yes, yeah, so the sample here, literally, you just turn it around 360 degrees, taking lots of x-rays. So it's made up of stills, and then they're digitally um, reconstructed to form 3D models. Um, so yeah, it's a very simple sample prep process. Just stick it in a tube, and then um, the machine does the rest. Oh, and um, importantly, at the CT lab here, so everything is basically made or produced in-house. So there's a lot of flexibility and enthusiasm to work on, you know, new ideas um, from, so they build the machines, the, um, they, the algorithms are from AU um, applied maths employees. Um, and then and the software I use as well is all made in-house. So um, constantly improving it. Um, and that really makes everything much easier having everybody on site. Um, all right, so yeah, this is just the reconstruction of the data. Um, this is a garden slater. Uh, this animation was done by Erica, uh, Erica Seeker. Um, and it just shows how the images are collected and then produce a 3D hole. Um, and then it leaves you data like this where you can animate it, you can cut, slice it, do whatever you want. Um, you get internal detail as well. Uh, so you just have a lot of flexibility uh, depending on your questions and what you want from your data. Um, so yeah, why did we think it would be helpful for the questions we were asking? So very significantly for archaeology, it's non-destructive. Um, obviously, archaeological material is limited, um, particularly in some regions where you only have a couple of key samples that you don't want to destroy. Um, so you literally just chuck it in the tube. Uh, so this here is a rat skull. Um, and the only, the number one rule is just make sure it doesn't move. Uh, if your sample moves, obviously you'll get some blur if so it won't align correctly. Um, so as long as it's in the tube and stabilized, um, you should get good images. Um, and so you get, internal detail, you're not just limited, limited to the surface, uh, like with other microscopy techniques. Um, and it provides greater analytical coverage because you get pretty much the whole uh, sample. Um, you don't have to just get the slides if you're doing a thin section. Um, all right. Uh, so just very briefly, um, micro CT and CT has been used in archaeology for quite a while. Uh, most famously for mummies, people love seeing those mummies. Um, they're normally medical CT machines, um, so obviously limited in the number of x-rays you can expose people to. Um, whereas micro CT machines, um, they're not for people and therefore you can increase the radiation exposure. Therefore, more x-rays and you get better images. Um, so, micro CT hasn't been used a lot in Archaeo blocking. Uh, so these four studies here are pretty much the only ones today and they're quite recent. Um, two of these are from uh, data collected at the ANU, so 
uh, we saw it's how they looked at identifying wood taxa from um, archaeological artifacts from Australia. Um, she was at ANU at the time. And then Jenny Pritchard, so she's in our research group. She was able to identify sugar cane and sweet potato from archaeological contexts at Cook Swamp in Hopping Bin. Um, so, yes, the array studies on archaeobotany is not great, um, but that just means there's plenty of work to do. Um, all right, and these are the two pieces of software that I use for my analysis, mainly Drishti, which makes the beautiful pictures and movies. Um, mainly because I'm looking at morphology, so it's more a qualitative um, tool, whereas Web Mango is better for quantitative analysis, um, segmenting data in various ways. Like, there are many different uh, tools and functions, it just depends what you want from the data. All right, so the first uh, three case studies are all related to sexually propagated plants. Um, and so it starts with rice uh, in Southeast Asia um, and how we first got thinking about um, these questions and using micro CT. So um, we can see that over time, that as excavations have increased in Southeast Asia, the number of sites where flotation has been used uh, has not grown at the same rate. Uh, and so flotation is the primary way we extract um, plant remains from soils. Um, so there is a definite lack of archaeobotanical finds in Southeast Asia in general. Um, some of that has to do with preservation in the region due to the, you know, the climate is not great. Um, but also, as we can see from this graph, that um, people haven't been looking for them. Um, and so we have this story of how rice came into Southeast Asia, particularly island Southeast Asia, with sort of as a package in the Neolithic. But the thing is that it wasn't really based on any archaeobotanical evidence. Um, the only um, references we have to rice in the region was really in rice tempered pottery. And so this, it's not uncommon that um, archaeologically you find uh, organic temper in pottery where people have uh, thrown it into the clay mix to sort of uh, strengthen the pot it helps with like expanding and contraction during firing. Um, so it was quite common in Asia to use rice tempera. Um, oh, and it's important to note that they're not throwing rice in. So they're consuming the rice and then the waste products that they're throwing in are like the husk or like, you know, stem or leaf material. Um, so we have a lot of that in pottery, but we couldn't, we couldn't look at it because it was inside the clay. Um, and again, we don't want to be destructive if we don't have to. Um, so we particularly want to look at that rice or the rice husk because we can then explore the relationships that people had with the, the rice in the region because it tells us something about its domestication status. Um, one particular point of difference between wild and domesticated rice is this point here, which is called uh, the spike at base and the incision scar on the base. Um, so in a wild population of rice, uh, the rice will disperse naturally with the wind. So the rice will naturally detach and it leaves a nice smooth scar on the husk here. Um, whereas if a human population is um, selecting uh, rice for their purposes, then you would select the rice that isn't being dispersed by the wind. You want the rice to stay on the plant. So it doesn't naturally disperse and therefore it then needs to be basically hacked off the plant like in threshing um, and it leaves a very uneven um, different type of scar. Um, and so as people are managing these rice populations, the number of rice spikelets with this sort of base would grow. Um, and so by looking at one, it doesn't tell you much, but as you count um, large amounts and you get the proportions, you can often see through time how um, the rice goes from wild to domesticated over a, often a long period of time. Um, studies have shown that these domestication episodes can last up to 3,000 years. Um, because it is basically, um, it's evolution, but through human mediated um, selection. So this is what we wanted to look in the pottery to find out 
what sort of rice was appearing in Southeast Asia during the Neolithic? Is, is this model of um, rice farming uh, based on actual archaeobotanical evidence? So this led to my master's work, uh, which led to this paper. Um, I just threw these images in because uh, okay, um, I offered my master's thesis and they look terrible. Um, so I have like learned something in the last four years. Um, but yeah, so we were able, able to look inside these sherds from sites in Vietnam and find rice carpet. So in red there, I would have to digitally like basically cut it out and then get the rice spiker and then look at the spiker basis. Um, and so we could see that there were domesticated um, rice spikelets in these sheds from Vietnam. Um, so for my PhD, uh, we thought we would develop this technique and see if we could apply it to other pottery assemblages from other sites. Um, so this is my first PhD paper, which is basically just outlining the protocol um, so that it can be replicated by others and um, yeah, applied in other contexts. Um, again, just simply identifying the spikelets um, and manually <laughs> manually uh, segmenting them. Um, and that just showing that you can build up like through caps, you can get um, quite an idea of what sort of population you're looking at. And so we'll find pretty much all domesticated so you can see these deeply recessed scars here. Um, if they were wild rice, it would basically be just a flat, a, a flatter surface. Um, and this is just to show the sort of resolution that I was getting. Um, so with the micro CT data, your resolution is determined by sample size um, and the diameter of your tube. Um, and we we're finding that uh, shows up to about 50 millimeters. Um, you, you had enough resolution to be able to distinguish these types of features. Um, so that's, I think most pottery shirts, like you wouldn't have to break to um, image them. Um, and these are just some of the other types of inclusions that we found in those Vietnamese shirts. So this is just a bit, bit of the rice husk, a little duck reed seed. Um, one shirt had voids where some sort of mineral had dissolved, whether it was during firing or uh, taphonomically, we're not sure. Um, and then obviously mineral inclusions as well. Um, all right, and so this was our first case study, um, which was presented to us uh, very kindly by Peter Bellwood here at the ANU. Um, and it, it provided the perfect example for us to apply this technique. Um, so Peter Bellwood had the shirt that had this uh, rice grain on it, which up to this point had been the earliest documented um, rice in island Southeast Asia. And it was dated to about uh, between in the 4,900 BP. Um, but it was a bit confusing because it was much earlier than um, any of the other rice we had in the region. So it was a bit of an outlier. Um, and we were like, well, let's image that show and see if we can find more rice see what it tells us about um, the rice populations at the time. Um, and so we have this image of this one rice husk uh, on the shirt. But then when we imaged it, which is this, the top two pictures up here, there was basically no organics in it. So as far as we're concerned, that's not a rice temperature. There's no evidence that people are, you know, consciously putting rice into that um, mix. So to us that that basically nullified the evidence in that just because you have one rice um, husk doesn't mean you have farming. Um, because we also know that um, if we look at lake callers around that time, there's wild rices um, in the environment and there's still wild rices growing um, around the glass area site today. Um, so to us, we didn't find any evidence of rice farming, um, which actually it's better with what we know about uh, rice domestication in Southeast Asia um, because it doesn't really seem to become widely um, uh, practiced until 2000 BP, which is around the time that our second show uh, dated to. So, from the same site, this page like Guasere, 
Um, but it was much later, so it was dated to around 2000 BP. Um, and so when we imaged that one, tons of rice, um, which was expected because um, it's much later, uh, fits with what we're expecting. Um, and so because we had that data set, we thought we'd apply our quantitative method then. Um, so this just shows like single slices. So this middle show is the one that has all the rice husk in it. You can see there's a lot of material in there, um, but it's these little popcorn-y shapes um, that are the actual spikelets, so that's what we're interested in. And then this shirt here is the earlier shirt, which basically has nothing organic in it. Um, so uh, my job was to go through and find all the spikelet bases. Um, for the paper, we, did, we picked a subsample of 50 and then went through and characterised them. Um, and what we found was um, percentages that were expected of a domesticated uh, rice population. Um, so about 70% uh, domesticated. Um, and 22% wild. Uh, we also found another type of spike at base, which is this one here, um, where the, the spike at, the precision scar was more on the base of the spike at base, um, which is, another type of rice uh, that you see in the local wild populations. Um, so you do have those local wild populations still um, appearing as weeds in your, um, your rice farming. Um, all right. So after we looked at the rice, um, we were then uh, presented with these sherds from UCL, um, which presented another perfect case study for our method. Um, because these two major cereal crops, sorghum and pearl millet, um, we know basically next to nothing about their original domestication. Um, and that is, again, due to the lack of archaeobotanical evidence that is found in the region. Um, but, again, we have these organic temperatures, so we thought, why not, why not look for um, <coughs> sorghum and pearl millet inside those shirts? Um, because it, up until a couple of years ago, the confusing thing about uh, sorghum and pearl millet was that archaeologically the earliest domesticated um, forms of these crops were in India. And yet we knew that the wild progenitor crops were actually from Africa. So the assumption was always that they were domesticated in Africa and then travelled uh, eastward uh, to India. But we had no evidence of this. Um, so there was a big gap that needed to be filled um, to figure out where exactly, where and when uh, these crops were domesticated. Um, so we were given sherds from a site KG23 um, in Sudan, and then two sites in uh, Mali. Um, I won't talk too much about the millet just because that paper's not going in my PhD, but um, there is a paper that you can have a look at. Um, so the sorghum, we, so the UCL uh, archaeobotany team had already done some surface impression work, which again, you're limited to the surface. So if there happens to be an impression of sorghum where you can see the base, that's great. Um, but they're often very difficult um, to make out what it is you're looking at, to have it at the right angle. Um, and so they published their findings um, in 2017 um, and they only found about 12 uh, spike up bases. And so we thought we could do better. Uh, we thought we might as well apply our technique to the same shirts and see if we can get um, a better return. Um, and so just looking at the surface impressions, sorghum slightly different in terms of uh, the domesticated and wild. So Similar though, uh, the wild you'll get a smooth um, separation from the plant, whereas in domesticated, again, through threshing, you're cutting the um, spike lid off. So it's actually leaving a little bit of the stem. Um, so again, just a little bit of a different form. Um, so these are some of the slices. You can see very clearly the organic remains. All right. And so one shirt, again, the organics, and then 
all of the intact um, spikelets in that one shirt um, and just one of them here. So it was clearly just looking at one shirt, we were getting a much better return than if you look at just the surface. Um, and you at least know that you're getting all the evidence that's in that one shirt. So you're getting, you know, as much um, information as you can out of each one. Um, and this just shows sort of how you're, you're basically excavating a shirt without having to destroy it. Um, so you can just separate the matrix from the spikelets. Um, and this one, you can clearly see that it's got that little bit of the stem attached. So it's from a domesticated population. Um, all right, uh, these are a few of the types. So the wild one, another, another um, trait of the domestication syndrome is over time, uh, grains get, you know, fatter and bigger because you want a bigger yield. So you can see that the shape of this uh, domesticated sorghum is much plumper uh, compared to the wild ones, which are, uh, they've got, they're longer than they are wide, basically. Um, and oops. so you've got the smooth abscission on these ones, and then this is a spike at fork, same abscission here, but um, just the, the grain and husk um, isn't present. Um, domesticated type, same here. Uh, we also found three examples of a different species of a small millet, uh, which, yeah, it just shows that whatever's in that shirt, you're going to find. <clears throat> All right, and just to compare the, um, the output to the surface impression method, um, so they, they didn't get many per shirt, basically. Um, 0.56 per shirt compared to ours, which we only looked at 12 shirts and we already got 83 spike up bases. So it just shows that you don't have to look at many uh, shirts to start building a picture of what sort of um, plant populations you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> All right, um, and this is, so this is putting that site into context in terms of the wider, um, the sorghum domestication um, episode. Um, this graph here shows the domestication of other cereals and what we've come to expect. Um, so we've got barley and uh, wheat uh, here, and you can see that it happens over a couple of thousand years and it's sort of gradual that you get, um, so non-shattering is just the domesticated form. Um, you're getting more and more in, uh, over time. Um, so you wouldn't expect it to just, you know, go immediately to 100% domesticated. Uh, and then we have rice here in China. Again, quite a um, established curve that shows a very obvious trend. Um, this is what we know about sorghum at the moment, which is not much. Um, so we have earlier sites uh, between like 7 and 4,000 BP where you're just getting entirely wild populations. Um, and then it wasn't until we looked at this uh, site, KD23, that we started to get, um, you know, assemblages that are mixed. So you can see you're right in the middle of that domestication episode. Um, there was another site that uh, a paper came out in 2018, um, this one here, K1, um, which also showed this sort of mixed assemblage, um, but it is dated to 1500 years later, um, which was slightly confusing in that it doesn't fit with this trend if we're then taking these new micro CT results into account, um, because we'd expect it to continue growing. Um, and so what we're left with is it seems that sorghum seems to have been domesticated earlier than we thought, um, assuming that there are sites in this region here that we haven't found yet. So earlier sites um, with lower percentages of domesticated sorghum. Um, but what this site uh, might tell us is that there's just uh, a variety of different sorghum populations being exploited in different ways um, because they're still obviously exploiting wild sorghum as well. Um, but again, there's not a lot of evidence from this later site. Um, so 
we could we could also apply that technique there if we've got some pottery shards, just so we have a bigger um, assemblage. When your assemblage is that small, I'm not sure you know um, how robust our conclusions are going to be. Um, but the other thing that was interesting about our results is that some shards had entirely domesticated sorghum and some had entirely wild and others had a mix. So it shows there is a variety within that site and maybe within the community, uh, maybe different groups are, you know, growing sorghum uh, in one area and other groups are exploiting wild uh, sorghum. Uh, it could be a, a difference in time, that at a certain time of the year you're harvesting uh, wild and then later you're harvesting domesticated. So it could be a mixture of different um, strategies, uh, but I think at this point we don't have enough evidence to dig down into it. Um, I mean, what we've learned is that we could definitely extract a lot more data uh, on sorghum uh, if we have the material. But now that we have this technique, we can apply it and hopefully, you know, fill in the bigger picture. Um, I'll just briefly go through the pearl millet. Um, so we had one shirt from this earlier site, AZ22, um, that was just packed with these um, pearl millet spikelets, um, literally hundreds of them, but they're all the same, um, which is this wild form. Uh, there's no stalk and it, um, the wild ones only contain one grain. Um, and then we have shows from a later site um, and MK36 where you had a mix of domesticated and wild. So you've got the little stalk attached here and then you have um, grains which are paired, um, sometimes coming two or three when they're domesticated. So yeah, you can also read that paper. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, all right, so those three papers were sort of half of my PhD and they're published. Um, and so the, the next step was to focus on the other half, um, which is a much more difficult um, problem in terms of asexually reproduced plants are not as well un understood. Um, we have a lot more difficulty even identifying these plants, um, let alone uh, distinguishing between domesticated and wild. Um, so the sort of plants that we're talking about are like yams, potatoes, sweet potato, um, the sort of starchy, tuberous plants. Um, and so, as we saw before, they make up quite a significant number of the most um, important crops, and yet, we don't know much about their histories. Sometimes we just know generally which area they're domesticated in. Um, but there's, there's definitely a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, there are a few reasons for why so little work has been done in this area. Um, it can be due, again, to preservation because, um, you know, they're, they're organic tissues and can often degrade. Um, the... Identifying them is very difficult because these sorts of plants are very plastic in that uh, in different environments they have different forms. Um, so genetically they're very diverse but also phenotypically. So the way that they grow in their environment can change a lot. Um, and often our methods have just not been uh, robust enough. Um, so it's only in the last, you know, 10, 20 years that people have begun looking at um, these sorts of plants that were probably just as important to populations in the past, we just don't know as much about them. Um, since uh, my supervisor, Tim Denham, and his work at Cook Swamp, um, identifying agricultural systems in Papua New Guinea back to 10,000 years, um, that focus on these sorts of plants um, means that these sorts of issues are now getting more attention. Um, and so this, uh, this paper just illustrated the sorts of um, archaeobotanical evidence that we are dealing with uh, when it comes to these plants and um, how they're slightly more troublesome than material crops. So we've got starch grains, phytoliths. Uh, phytoliths are like silica that build up in the plant and can sometimes be diagnostic. Um, but the third type is what I'll be talking about today, which is archaeological parenchyma or parenchyma. Um, which are, is a bit misleading in that, so parenchyma 
is basically ground tissue. So every plant has a lot of parenchyma cells. But in a, a root or tuber, it's the, the cells that are just packed with starch, um, which aren't that distinguishing by themselves. So when we're looking at archaeological parenchyma, we're often looking at more uh, distinctive features like vascular bundles or like uh, calcium oxalate crystals that build up. So while I say archaeological parenchyma, it's just the type of tissue. It's parenchyma doesn't really help in the identi identification too much. Um, all right. So when we wanted to look at these uh, species, we thought we'd start with the the reference collection of one of the only people who has looked at these sorts of plants in depth, which is John Hadler. And his reference collection is at UCL in London. So we went over there and subsampled uh, his collection. Um, so we selected these species uh, to start building our own reference collection in order to scan them through micro CT, um, sort of work on a protocol to identify them, but also having digital data to then be able to make that uh, reference collection widely available. Um, any reference collections that have been uh, made in the past um, are not uh, widely available to other researchers. Uh, so that was the main goal, to try and make it more accessible and then get the ball rolling on this sort of work. Um, so his reference collection, there are all char. Um, so trying to look at them in the form that we would find them in archaeological deposits. Um, assuming that people are eating these plants and then um, the, the waste is what we're going to find. So often the peel, um, the skin which has been burnt, um, and obviously fleshy, like fresh material is not going to survive. So if we're looking at archaeological parenchyma, it's probably going to be charred. And so we, instead of starting from scratch again, which so many people do, we went to UCL and subsampled Heather's material. Um, brought it back to ANU and then have scanned an awful lot of it. Um, and so again, we didn't want to start from scratch. And uh, this is Heather's um, sort of breakdown of the features to look at um, to identify these sorts of plants. Um, the problem with archaeological parenchyma or like, um, you know, uh, roots and tubers is that they're not, you're not looking for one specific um, characteristic as you are with the cereal plants. You know, you're looking for a very specific trait. Whereas uh, with these, you're looking for a combination of all these things. So not one thing is going to determine, oh, that is a, a piece of tarot. Um, it's more of a differential um, diagnosis in that you're, you're eliminating what it isn't, and then hoping that you can get down to species, but you might only get to, you know, um, genus level. Um, depending on how many of these features you have, you don't always, obviously with archaeological um, material, you can't control the type of material you have. So you're sort of, it depends if you're lucky enough to get the more diagnostic aspects in the sample. Um, so this is just, they're not very pretty to look at, I'm sorry. Um, but this is what they look like pieces of charcoal basically. Um, and so what we expect is that a lot of people have this material um, that they've collected from their sites as charcoal um, and yet is not analysed. Um, so hopefully uh, we can set up a system so that people will start looking at this material and separating it from their wood charcoal in their assemblages. Um, so to try and get all of the variety um, of the species, I started by imaging whole tubers um, and then sort of a, a middle of the range couple of like one or two centimeter pieces and then some tiny pieces about um, half a centimeter. Um, so again it just shows you how easy it is to image these things. You just stack them in a tube, put some, put some foam on top and uh, yeah that's as destructive as you have to be. Um, just if you have like one or two archaeological pieces, you obviously don't want to cut them up if you don't have to. <clears throat> uh, this is just showing, so compared to um, how reference material has been done in the past, which is just, you know, cutting, cutting a slice and then imaging, you know, one slice, um, you're getting the whole piece. 
uh, which is very important with these sorts of species because, as I say, you need a combination of elements and you're hoping that you, be, you catch them all um, by imaging the whole piece. Um, um, but also when, when your species are so different, like one tarot variety and another can be so different from each other, you want to be able to uh, capture as much variety as possible. And that's what we're noticing in uh, the reference samples we have, that um, some of the same species look entirely different. Um, so the more you have, uh, the more confident you can be in your identifications. Um, so because it's quite a big undertaking to start a reference collection um, of so many species, we thought the best place to start was to narrow it down to five species. And so one of the papers I'm writing up now is this one. She's looking at these five key species um, before we publish the second paper, which will sort of align with my protocol paper on the, um, the cereals and pottery, so that we have two um, sort of mirrored uh, protocols to um, So we picked these five species for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, they are important economic crops in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and the Pacific. Um, so we've got taro and alocasia macroriza, which are both of the same family, so they're both arids. So we could work on differentiating two arid species. Um, we've got two yam species, um, which are obviously going to be more similar than different. Um, so we thought we'd start with two, trying to differentiate the two, and then working out from there. Um, and then sweet potato uh, differs from the others in that it's, um, it's actually made up of root tissue. So it would be a different structure than say, taro and um, giant taro, which are uh, stem. So again, different structure. So we thought it, it was quite a good variety um, to start um, and then getting more complex as we add others. Um, I have hundreds of images, so I'm not going to show them all. Um, I will just show you Tara because it's the best to look at. Um, so this is the whole uh, tuber. Um, just some things to note. You can see um, it's sort of darker in colour in the middle, which equates to lower density. Um, and the reason we're seeing that is because in the middle of the tuber, you're getting these, um, these arenchyma, arenchyma, which are just you know, spaces between cells. And so your sample is getting more dense uh, the further in you go. Um, here we can see this is, so these are parenchyma tissues. They're just the ground mass that make up most of that tuber. Um, and so these denser areas are related to vascular bundles. Um, so they, they, they present quite clearly. Um, and then you can see, because they're randomly, um, they're like assorted all over the, the ground tissue, um, you know that that's a monocot. So that's, you know, you can start with that as a monocot, not a dicot. Um, we've got, this is the outer layer, the periderm that survived. It doesn't really survive that often. So how, how useful it would be with archeological um, identification, I'm not sure. Um, on the outside of the tuber, we've got uh, these little root scars um, and the apical bud. So basically they're just different features externally that can help us differentiate. Um, and then we've got this sort of um, open void under the bud, which with my reference samples occurs again and again. So even though I'm not, not a botanist, it was sort of like looking at a lot of these plant species and just identifying patterns. And then looking at it again, just to see what differentiates them all. Um, and then we have, this is a vascular bundle here. So in the case of taro, you've got the, the xylem that survives around the outside, and then the phloem which has disintegrated in the middle. Um, so that happens quite often with taro, but the thing that I'm noticing, because I have so much data, like some, some areas preserve in one way and in other areas they don't. So again, I'm just finding that the more data you have, the more successful you're going to be. Um, so the, probably the most, um, the most famous thing about taro is that you need to cook it um, because it's full of these crystals. 
Um, calcium oxalate crystals that if you eat it raw are very uncomfortable. Um, and so they, they appear really nicely on the CT data because they appear as these little like star high, high density areas. Um, and you can see here, so this is an archaeological example that we know is Tara because um, we've also had the, the genetics, the DNA um, confirm that. Um, and we can see the vascular bundle, which is similar to the other, but one is just disintegrated where we put the xylem around the outside. Um, and these little red bits are the calcium oxalate crystals. And you can see, particularly on the external surfaces, they, they form these patterns, um, circles around the bundles. Um, so I'm seeing that in all the reference samples. So that's, um, that's something to note. And then with the ground tissue, they occur quite um, randomly. Like they don't just, um, you know, occur around the vascular bundle. Um, so we've also got two types of crystals in Tara. We've got these little, um, they're sort of like <laughs> little needles that occur in bundles called raffies. Um, and so they're, they're thought to be very uncomfortable when you eat them. Uh, they are, they appear as like little needles basically. Um, and druses, which are little um, crystal clusters. Um, so you've seen both uh, in the tarot. Um, and this is where the in, inter, intraspecies uh, variability um, becomes noticeable, that one tarot sample can look completely different to another. This one sample has these beautiful crystals that are so well formed, but they're only in this one. So there's obviously something different. It's either a slightly different variety or something in the growth environment, environmental factor um, that's different, um, but we're not sure. And therefore we need to build up just the amount of data to capture that variability. Um, we can also see it's like um, they're, they've either melted here or they're water soluble. Um, so they sort of uh, disintegrated in places, but we're still getting the druses, which we see in other tarot samples as well. So we see similarities, but also differences. <clears throat> um, again, so uh, I looked at a lot of street potato as well, and oh no, we're going to um, So this again, this I had one sample which has these massive, massive crystal growths. Um, which is completely different to any of the other ones, which, so all the other samples we had in the reference collection were bought at Woolworths. Um, this one was from the Highlands in Papua New Guinea. So it's not surprising they're different. Um, whether it's, again, different variety, growth environment, we're not sure, but trying to capture as much as we can. Um, so we've got two species that are in the same family. So I was looking at trying to differentiate them. And with the calcium oxalate crystals, there was um, very significant differences. Um, again, with the tarot, you can see them sort of clustered around the bundles. Um, in the Alcasia, there was just this layer, like dense of all these uh, raffid bundles. Um, just really dense, and then these holes where the um, vascular bundles uh, would come through. Um, but yeah, significantly different. Um, so, you know, assuming that it's uh, similar to all the Alocasia uh, varieties, uh, very identifiable. And then the yams, because I only have two in this study, um, there was one feature that could differentiate them. Um, it's obviously going to become more difficult because there are a lot of different yam species. Um, it's this feature here. Um, so it's under the, the cortex of uh, the samples and it's, Got this little like dense area that is like in every reference sample of the Dioscuria alata. So that was very different to the Dioscuria escalenta that I looked at, where there seemed to be these uh, fiber bundles under the surface. Um, but they just appear very differently, and it's nice that there's one feature that seems to come up time and time again. Um, but uh, yeah. The more, the more yams we have, the more troublesome it's going to be. Um, uh, another thing that we need to consider is tissue damage, because obviously these plants are being burnt. 
Um, but tissue damage can also happen. Like for example, this one on the left, I kept looking at it and I was like, why is it so awful? And then I went back to Hathers, um, his reference material. And so that one was rotten before he fired it. Um, so it never really had a hope of making anything out of that. Um, then you see areas that are just severely fire damaged and carbonized, like here where you can see it's just formed like um, a mass of carbon. Um, and frustratingly, it is it does vary a lot throughout a sample. Sometimes you see it more on the outside, sometimes on the inside, depending on the sample itself, if something's boiling and bubbling or tearing. Um, it's, it's different within samples, um, but just try to um, separate that from what you're looking at to what is damaged is also um, something that needs to be considered. Um, fortunately, with sweet potato, something that's um, known to differentiate sweet potato is that it has these radial tears around the outside. Um, so um, we've seen this in archaeological samples as well as all my reference samples. You see these tears where the tissues are just tearing apart. Um, so in some, in some ways, it can be a help. Um, often it is not. Um, and this is just showing that you have to be lucky in the sample that you get. Um, so this was Dysteria alata. Um, and so these are just a lot of little tiny samples. And you can see here, all these ones here are just masses of parenchyma cells. Like you, you can't really make anything out of them because you don't have any um, defining features. Um, so if you're finding these in your archaeological deposits, I'm not sure there's much you can do with them, to be honest. Um, I mean, there are certain things, like you can see there's very few crystals in yams and there's very few um, that are coming up um, here, just a couple. Um, but if you do get a piece of the peel or basically the skin, um, you are going to get these features, like the way if you get um, roots or shoots, um, the way that the skin bubbles and the various layers under the skin. So if you, if you have a lot of samples and you image a lot of them, uh, chances are you'll get something that is going to be diagnostic. But as with all archaeological material, it's luck. Um, and so again, for us, we're imaging as much as we can um, to try and find out what we can do with um, material like this. Just trying to get as much information as possible. Um, all right, so this is just going back to my PhD, sum up of where I'm at. Um, so those first three papers are published, they're done. Um, and so these two are what I'm working on now, um, writing up hopefully this year. And so this, this second section, we're hoping to have it mirror the first, in that um, I can publish a protocol that sets out um, the steps of identifying these features and then comparing. Um, and then the five species paper, um, just to, to start the reference collection from somewhere, um, in the hopes that people then read those papers and then either get in touch with us and send us uh, reference material, because um, I know there are, there are people out there who have built their own reference collections that um, are obviously in their possession. Um, so it would be great if we could uh, scan those, but also to get archaeological material and then start comparing it to our reference collection and, um, yeah, just trying to build up some sort of starting point for identifying um, these archaeological parenchyma pieces. Um, all right. And I have a lot of people I need to thank my panel, Tim uh, Denham, Tim Sandon, and Doreen Fuller. Um, the guys at the CT lab, uh, particularly Levi and Mick, for letting me run their machines every day. Um, I don't know why they let me do it. Um, and then, yeah, Erica for showing me how to make animations. I'm very thankful for that. Um, and then Rachel and Peter um, in our school, which you guys have been great. And then all the guys at UCL, they provided us with so much material. Um, and so it's just great just to be able to get into their reference collections and actually use some of this stuff. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I won't go into this, but this is just some of the offshoots that have come from working with micro CT. It really does open up a lot of um, other avenues in terms of data collection and maybe possibly automating that data collection, which we're working on, because at the moment it can, when you have a lot of data, it obviously means a lot of work. Um, but when you have digital data, hopefully you can work on some sort of automated segmentation or who knows. <laughs> All right, I think I'm done. Thanks, Alicia. That's great. Um, any questions in the room or online? Thank you. Start. That was lovely. Thank you. It's really, really cool. Um, I guess I have one little point and then one question. So, one point CT is not completely non destructive. If yeah. you're doing DSR or something and it works in T, please don't just stick it in there. Yeah, so that is true. We want to date it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had that discussion recently about, say, like, we're not entirely sure what it does to DNA, for example. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, with yeah. the protein, we're starting to suspect that, like, when we try to date something in CT scan, it's harder. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, the data's a bit fuzzy. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, definitely depending on sample. Yeah. Yeah. And what the CT do for the scan, I guess. <laughs> It's, it's not these guys, it's the people in France doing it. <laughs> <laughs> these guys are fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and my question was, so with the um, brain plant, mm. um, you said that there might be more variation in terms of how people are growing it, maybe than between species. Mm -hmm. Is that potentially even then more exciting, that you might be able to see how people are growing these things and, you know, growing mm. them? Well, I think because it is more complicated, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, yeah, it's, it shouldn't be done because you're right, there's, the more variability, the more interesting it is. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it's not just like the species, if you get like controlled growing experiments mm. or something. Yeah, exactly. Because if we're finding these samples that look completely different, then how are we going to, we need to find out why and in what conditions they look this different from others. Um, yeah, I think you're right in that it is much more exciting. Yeah. yeah. And one, one other question, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, like, if you're, you said that in archaeological collections, you're mainly, like, interested in maybe the peel of some of the species. Mm. Do you actually find more peel than other stuff? Because I guess people are, they peel these things before they... That's a good question, which, because we haven't um, looked at a lot of archaeological material yet, um, I can't say. The ones that I have looked at are peel, so <laughs> we've only looked at a handful though, so yeah. The peel is found in a number of sites, yeah, and mm. has been just recorded as peeling, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, um, so yeah, I yeah. Think, um, which is fortunate, right? Because yeah. it could be really handy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> am I allowed to say that we've looked at some non stuff? Okay. Yeah, yeah, non based stuff. Yeah, we have some non based stuff which looks like a sweet potato, and it's definitely, even just looking at it with your eye, you can see it's the, the outside. The here. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, a lot of these sites are comparing domestic and wild rice. Hmm. Uh, if it had been domesticated around that site, hmm. would you not expect to see a whole load of intermediate types yes. as well? Yeah. Um, you see those? Yeah, but. <laughs> As in, so depending on, you know, the point in the chronology, you get all sorts of mixtures um, between, you know, the wild types, the domesticated, and you also get introgressions as well of wild that's made its way into your domesticated, you know, field. Um, so, yes, depending on where it is in the chronology, you would expect to sign. So you're seeing just, just two types, but in different ratios. Yeah, and, but once you get to like, you know, full on, you know, open field rice farming, those, the traits are sort of set um, genetically and phenotypically. So you do get more standard like percentages of like 70, 80% domesticated. You'll always get like a few other types in there, which is why if you get one or two, it's not really telling you anything. Um, it's all about quantity at that point. Um, yeah, because every other cereal, like where we have these um, really well developed domestication curves, um, you get all that variety and then they sort of taper off, they get set. Yeah.
<laughs> I haven't been able to question it, and there's another one, like, but uh, like the domestication process will probably be gradual, right? Mm -hmm. So you probably have samples that are in this thing. So where, how do you draw the line between the less non Um That is a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you can say domesticated or not, you can put them along a spectrum of, you know, it fits in along this timeline at a certain point. Like, because you, you need the quantity, um, you're, you're not saying the population is wholly one or wholly the other. You're saying it's always a mixture. Yeah, I, think yeah. I was thinking more about specific brains. Like, you look at one brain, mm. it's in Oh, well, there is, like... When we when we do the characterization, we always have a an um, indeterminate. Um, right. For example, like when we did, because we're trying to automate this process with that one show, I've done like hundreds of the cipher faces, and so I imaged them all. And me and Tim sat down and did them separately, and said that's wild, that's domesticated, and then we like combine them, and any that we can agree on would be like indeterminate, and we don't include them um, because of course there's going to be variation um, that. You just can't be certain yeah. of. Yeah. <clears throat> but with um micro CT, that that the percentage that are indeterminate is much smaller. Whereas if you're looking at surface impressions, because it's not that clear, um, you like for example when they were doing their surface impression analysis of the solving shows, their indeterminate category was a lot bigger. Whereas we could cut it down to nearly zero. I think mm. there are only a couple we can agree on. Um, so yeah, just the quality of the data you're getting means that you don't get as many of those. Yeah. Cool. And then Rebecca has a question on that. Rebecca Blackney. Um, did you compare the microbial pathology between good and good specimens of Tara? She's wondering if the differences in the crystals between specimens would have to do with cooking. Ah, okay. We haven't so in that reference collection we don't have any uncooked. Um, but we definitely have so I'm not sure if Jenny has it in her fresh mm -hmm. reference collection. But yes, yeah, so um, Jenny Pritchard, who also works with us, she's got some fresh specimen that we also want to scan as well and add into the, um, the reference collection. Um, so yeah, this is just a start and we're hoping to like build it out to those things. Um, we have like, for example, in Pavis collection, we have some that were fresh when they were charred and some that were dry. Um, but we haven't got any samples that are, that are fresh that we've scanned yet. Um, just because we, like, to start with, we don't think we'll find them in the archaeological record. Um, and often, like, I sit there reading all these, like, botanical descriptions of these plants, and then I look at my samples, and because they're so, like, um, degraded from the firing, like, the botanical descriptions are often not that useful to me, um, because you're looking for things that don't survive. Um, and so I figured that if I'm looking at charred specimens, I'm going to see um, things that I would expect to see in the archaeological sense. Yeah. Any other questions? It's Erica that congratulates you on this chat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a question. Uh, did you take on the chat? Maybe I'll leave it next to Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Christina, by the way. I agree. <laughs> um, hang on, what's the first bit? What are the, the costs involved? Um, that's a Levi question. Um, <laughs> so, at the moment, we've been very fortunate in that applied maths have um, scanned a lot of our stuff, like paid for by applied maths. Um, so we are building that reference collection um, as much as we can now in terms of the future. Um, so costs, uh, I would say they're like $400 a scan, right? But the benefit is, is that you can often get if you've got tiny samples of a couple of millimetres, you can stack lots of them in a tube um, and scan them all at once. So with even like the pottery shirts, I would scan like six of them in one go. Um, the sample prep is basically non-existent. Um, so in terms of like 
time. Um, it's not as much of a cost. Um, obviously, there's a cost for the scans, um, but I think per sample it actually works out to be quite low considering how much you can scan all at once. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the cost is sort of is relative to the size of your sample, right? So, yeah, for sure. And um, often brain chemistry is small, so you mm. can do a lot in one hit. Yeah. Um, and it gives you a big bang, actually, for that buck, because yeah. rather than like in previous SEM or just uh, reflected light microscopy work, you're just looking at one plane. Mm. But using this, you can you look through the whole sample, you can find your idealized plane to view it and also isolate features that may not uh, be apparent on the surface. So I think even though there are some costs involved, um, I don't think they're actually prohibited. And the, the uh, visualization software, we should say, Drishti is shareware, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's available, it's free and online. Mm -hmm. So really, there, that is the only cost, really, mm -hmm. is a scan. And as you can say, you can bundle into those yeah. scans. And also, if you then destroy your sample through other methods, you mm -hmm. then, it might not be the sample, but you do have a 3D representation of your sample. So it's also preserving um, data in case, who knows what's going to happen if your department has a flood or, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, Never happen. No, no. Yeah. Um, so at least you can preserve your samples as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's entirely dependent on the sample. Like if you have one thing to scan, then it's going to be a lot per sample. But if you have a lot of samples, you can do it in one go and it probably works out to be quite good. Yeah. <clears throat> Might be another question there, but I don't have it. It's probably too much. Oh, hi, Jersey. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, anybody have the last questions? Just want to say that the talk will be available on uh, YouTube. There's a part of YouTube channel now. Uh, obviously, you've seen this talk, but in the future, you should know that uh, everything will be up there. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, Nash. Final months of your thesis on communication. Yeah. All right, thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for coming.